Okay, welcome to chapter 28. Chapter 28 is going to really round out that uh, those first four chapters uh, in this section. It's primarily all about uh, negotiable instruments and different types, and with a focus on checks because checks being the most common type. And in fact, much of what we're going to talk about in here, particularly at the beginning of this chapter, is going to be about checks. Um, so I am going to be using uh, the um, 15th edition of Business Law, uh, Text and Cases, Clarkson Miller. So if I make any sort of reference to um, page numbers, that's going to be the 15th edition, just so you know. And we are on chapter 28, if you're trying to follow along in your text, and you're perfectly welcome to follow along in your text. Uh, remember the negotiable instruments, which we're covering, this is unit 5, is chapters 25, 26, 27, 28. Uh, begins at page uh, 462 of your text. In this particular chapter, chapter 28, which is the last uh, of these uh, four units, uh, that's going to begin on page 514. So let's uh, jump in first and foremost with what is a check? Okay, so a check is the most common type of a negotiable instrument there is. Um, there are lots of different types of negotiable instruments. There are uh, certificates of deposit, there are different types of drafts, uh, but a check is by far the most common. Now it used to be that almost all checks were physical. Increasingly we're starting to see more electronic checks and we're going to touch on that at the end. We are um, going to focus on uh, the relationship, because this is a business law class, with banks and these checks. And to start off, a bank being any person or corporation engaged in banking, savings and loan, credit union or trust, and most of the time, the drawer, that is the person against whom, or the individual or entity against whom the check is drawn, the person that's holding the money that's going to pay it, is a bank in a check. So the first type of specialized check um, that we're going to uh, talk about is a cashier's check. And if you look at page 515 of your text, it's got a picture of one. And I uh, went out and I cropped one a little bit later. There it is, a Bank of America one. Um, so the draw her here is the Bank of America. That's against whom it's it's being paid. Um, the draw e that is who's going to get the money is uh, Schuster and Sabin LLC, and the person who signed it is uh, Matt Johnson, and he's signing for the bank. So he is the bank here is the drawer and the draw e, and that's what makes it a cashier's check. All right, let's back up for a second. It is used in situations where you want an added level of security, but you want the certainty of cash. So I want to make sure, you know, I don't want to take a check from you that's a regular personal check because I don't know if it's good, but I'll take a cashier's check. And you want to use a cashier's check because it's maybe better than handling large amounts of cash. So it is nearly equivalent in the way it functions to cash. It is more difficult to dishonor than a regular check check and there are there's more ways in which you can recover expenses interests and consequential damages if there's wrongful dishonor now there's also a, a subcategory that we're not going to talk much about of teller checks uh, this is when a bank draws a check on another bank uh, i mention that because you may come across that terminology almost all banks maintain accounts in other banks. And if you think about this in a business sense, that makes it a, it's pretty reasonable. Because let's suppose I'm BB&T and I'm cashing checks for Wells Fargo and Wells Fargo is cashing checks for BB&T. You know, people do business with both of these. So it would be convenient for them to be able to issue checks to each other in that way. And that's called a teller's check. All right, so there quickly is a sample of a uh, cashier's check, uh, the amount seven eight thousand seven seventeen. The drawer uh, up there in the corner is Bank of America. I don't know if you're able to see that. I think you are. And then it's signed here by Matt Johnson for Bank of America. So Bank of America is both the drawer and the draw e, and payable to Schuster and Sabin LLC Limited Liability Corporation. Uh, now travelers checks. Um, Boy, you know, traveler's checks used to be much more common. And I'm, I'm going to let, I didn't include a, a picture of one um, in these slides because I don't like the slides to get completely out of hand in length. 
but on page 516 you're going to see an example of an American Express uh, traveler's check. And these used to be, I think, far more common, particularly for travel. And what it would be, again, is people didn't want to carry cash because if your cash got stolen overseas, it's gone. But if you were carrying a traveler's check and it was stolen, no one was allowed to cash it except you. So if someone stole it and forged your name, that's your problem, or really the person who receives it problem, not yours individually. And you can get that money back. Uh, they seem to be dying out primarily because there is fees associated with them. They were much more common. I can remember traveling in my youth to places like England uh, back in the 1970s, and uh, pretty much everybody used Barclays from England or American Express. So Chase had its own, but those were the two big ones. Essentially, it's payable on demand, drawn on or payable at a bank. And the only time I still see a lot of them are in China. Um, I've heard at least that it's used more often in China than other places. I, I think that will change too as China ties itself closer and closer economically to the single world system. Okay, um, certified check, a uh, little bit different here. What's a certified check? Um, a certified check, essentially you go down to the bank you present a check. It's, it's just one of your regular checks. So let's suppose my name's John Doe and I'm writing a check to Peter Beck. And I hand the bank that check and I say, I want you to certify this check. So they'll take it and they'll look in my account. They say, okay, John Doe, you have $1,000 in your account. This check that you just gave us to be certified is $100. We will stamp on it certified. So what the bank does right there is it takes a hundred dollars out of your account so that when that check gets in it's going to be paid first out of that hundred dollars so if it's if a check is stamped certified it functions very much like a cashier's check or cash now banks this tends to mess up banking um, records and stuff a little bit so they're not wild about doing this Banks are not required to certify checks. They will for good customers. What they much prefer to do is issue cashier's checks. They'll just take the money flat out of your account, issue you a certified check, and then they're done with it. Um, so they don't have to. They're still used. I, I haven't seen a lot of them, to be honest about it. Um, lost, destroyed, or stolen, especially checks. What happens when one of these checks gets lost? Well, the, the big, the good news is for like a traveler's check or certified check is you can get a refund. Um, and basically it allows you the protection of refund for lost, destroyed, damaged, stolen, um, but also the flexibility of cash, which is why you can see these things still might get used. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the bank. Um, you know, uh, banks, um, there is a relationship. Uh, and it's kind of not the relationship you think. Most of the time people do with banks, maybe they have their mortgage with the bank. They kind of think like the bank is their boss. But really, it's kind of the flip of that. And we're going to talk about contractual relationships. There is a relationship that is created. When you go down to First National Bank of Fuquay and you open up a deposit, so let's suppose my name's John Doe, I go down to the First National Bank of Fuquay and I open up a thousand dollar account. Well, the bank takes my money and it promises to give me that money back. That means the bank is a debtor. It owes money to who? Me, the creditor. So there is a creditor debtor relationship, and there's also the agency relationship. Now, we've talked in Business Law 1 a little bit about agency, the old term master and servant or agent and principal, but an agency um, comes into existence here. Uh, in fact, we're going to classify the relationship between the bank and the depositor really as either creditor and debtor, creditor and debtor, which is ironically you being the creditor, agent to principal and the bank being your agent or contractual and most of what follows this slide we're going to focus on this contractual relationship what does the bank under the theory of contract have to do 
Now I say, pardon me when I sip my coffee, I say have to do, remember, in any contract, you can break any contract. You just have to be willing to pay the penalty and the cost of breaking that contract. So let's talk about some of these contractual relationships that banks have. Um, first of all, they have a basic duty to honor the check. You have $1,000 in your account. You write a check for $100. Money in your account. You sign it to Peter Beck. Peter Beck takes it. The bank is supposed to pay that check. That is a contractual relationship. That's why you're doing business with them. If they refuse, if they make some sort of mistake and they don't pay the check, they're in breach of that contract. And this gives you the right to sue them. Now, under the UCC, this is just a general cause of action, the dishonor. You don't have to technically prove breach. You don't have to prove a warranty violation. Now, obviously, underlying all this, if I write a check for $100, there better be $100 in the account. If there's not $100 in the account, the bank doesn't have to pay more than what's in the account unless we start to talk about overdrafts. Um, which is, you know, something that's pretty common for most people uh, with checks. Okay, so what's an overdraft? If there's insufficient funds in the account, the bank may lawfully, without a breach of the contractual relationship or the debtor-credit relationship or the agency relationship, not pay the check. Um, however, they may, and there's just some references to the UCC here, UCC 4-402 sub A sub B, they may have an agreement that they will take and pay over the amount of money you have deposited. Now, notice that that changes the debtor-creditor relationship. All of a sudden, as opposed to you being the creditor, the bank owing you money for what you've got deposited, you're now a debtor. So it flips. Um, so, you know, you could start to look at it that way. But most of the time, what's going to happen is we're going to have an agreement to pay, and that means it's more contractual. Now, interesting little foible here. What happens when you have joint accounts? So you have John Doe and Mary Doe having an account together, or John Doe and his brother Peter Doe. If an overdraft is issued, signed by just John Doe, the general rule is the other party is not responsible. Now that can be changed under contract. Um, but the general rule, and that can be really important if you've got a checking account with somebody else. You know, one of the things you want to know is, okay, in the event of overdraft, do I owe money if the other guy writes a bunch of bad checks? You should know that in your contractual relationship. Now, if a check is dishonored, you can resubmit it multiple times. There might have been an error, but you should notify all endorsers because the clock starts to run. All right, we're going to talk a little bit now about post-dated checks. And my one of the things that is, and, um, you know, post-dated checks are referred to in the UCC. Um, you do see them. Um, you know, the, there's some protection provided under the UCC. Um, 4-404. Uh, uh, is the requirement. Excuse me, I'm trying to hang up my phone here so it's not interfering. Okay. Um, Post-dated checks technically in North Carolina are illegal. Now I say technically because there's lots of things that are technically illegal and you're not supposed to do. In, in some ways, writing a post-dated check in North Carolina, it is both a criminal act to write them and to receive them. Now, I, I say that, but that's kind of not true, and that, that can be confusing for some students. Uh, my general recommendation is in any sort of business situation, do not, do not use post-dated checks. They're bad ideas. Um, you might run afoul of a jurisdiction like North Carolina where enforcement could become an issue. So um, the UCC uh, says uh, that, yes, um, if you give proper notice, if you say, okay, I don't want you to pay, all right, um, and the bank goes ahead and pays, and there's damage because of this, then the bank has to eat the damage. And I think that's UCC 4-401 uh, sub C or B, I forget which. But if you wrongfully 
put a stop order, post date a check, and you, you said, okay, we're going to post date it, and they went ahead and paid it, and you didn't suffer any damages, you can't sue. Now, one of the things about post dated checks is you've got to let the bank know about it. And if you don't, the bank usually can pay over it. Again, I, I don't recommend post dated checks. All right, um, next topic stale checks and death. <laughs> death comes for us all, I guess. Um, death or incompetence. If a check is older than six months, it is called under the law a stale check. And a bank is not obligated to pay a check that is presented six months from its date. Now, there is an exception here for a certified check, but the UCC can UCC 4-404 says if a bank gets in a check, so what are we? We're in January. If I got in a check from last May, right? So it's well over six months, then the bank would not have to pay that, and it would not be a breach of that contractual relationship. Now, what happens when people who write checks die or they become incompetent? If the bank is unaware of the death, okay, which obviously can happen, um, it doesn't automatically revoke the bank's authority to accept. Um, now, if, if you didn't have that provision, which is uh, 4-405, uh, banks would constantly be having to check to see if people are alive. So if you're unaware that someone's dead or incompetent, banks can pay checks. Now, once they've got a date of death they know, okay, uh, banks can pay for an additional 10 days because I could write a check today. I could die tomorrow, the 21st, but the bank could pay through the 30th of this month. Stop order payments. So um, this, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is basically when people say, um, I don't want the bank to go forward and pay um, this, this check still. Now, the UCC says that's fine. Um, it's 4-403. says that's fine, but only the account holder can request this. And you can't use it on checks that are certified or already accepted We've, we've talked about that. You couldn't even use it on a uh, travel check. But if I call up the bank and tell them, hey, I want to stop payment on this, it's good for 14 days. Um, if I give them a written notice, it's six months. Now, notice that that triggers also the stale check if it's over six months. If a bank pays over a stop order, the bank has liability to the extent that the customer lost money. If the, if the customer is trying to defraud somebody else and the bank went ahead and paid and you could show, hey, you got a new car for this and you wrote a check and you tried to put a stop order check in, we paid the check, um, you didn't suffer any loss. So um, it's important. Uh, you got to be careful about stop orders because sometimes they don't necessarily stop holders in due course from collecting. And if you put in a wrongful stop order, uh, you can be liable for damages, damages that apply, apply or come out of that stop order. Uh, all right, forged signatures, a little bit about this. Um, a bank gets liability if it takes a check, which is signed, you know, let's suppose the checking account's the name of John Doe, and, and uh, Tommy Thief steals John Doe's checkbook, and he writes a check, and the bank goes ahead and pays that check when it comes in. Okay, who has liability? Well, the general rule is the bank has liability, because the bank is supposed to check to make sure that any negotiable instrument, any check that's been written, is indeed signed by the customer. However, if the customer substantially contributed to any forgery that went on, it can be more than just a signature. You know, let's suppose you gave someone a blank check and said, oh, fill this in for your Girl Scout cookies for 20 bucks. I don't have time. You hand them a blank check. And they fill it in for 40 bucks. Or they modify it. Well, you could have some liability, Joe, customer. Customers also have a duty to timely inspect their bank statements to see as forgeries coming in. And if they don't discover it within 30 days and the bank has paid a forward one and it's 
six months or a year later and these all these checks have come in and this is somewhat common during embezzlement issues then the customer can have liability that liability um, now once it's discovered once we discover that there is forgery then liability runs forward if a bank fails to check very large checks they may be liable so if the bank gets a check say for a million dollars and it just goes ahead and catches it that usually sets up bells and whistles and you can now obviously if the bank's stuck if if Tommy thief takes money writes a bad check cashes the check gets the money um, the checking account owner me doesn't have to pay so who has to pay well the first person you can go after is the forger if you can catch Tommy thief he owes the money um, if there is someone that endorsed it so let's suppose that the thief buys something at Walmart Walmart takes it um, at that point you know the bank will kick it back uh, and say okay well that's that's Walmart's problem so we can go back and, and get uh, uh, some of those issues um, <clears throat> Uh, checks with forged endorsements. Again, the bank is liable to the customer. You basically are going to look at who took the forged endorsement. So it, it's all pretty much um, kind of like the old game of hot potato. Um, if if you, uh, the, the last person or the first person that takes the forged endorsement that we can find, they're the ones that have liability. All right, what about an altered check? Now, altered checks can have some special rules, but basically here, a bank has a duty to inspect a check. So let's suppose I wrote a check for $100 and I draw a straight up and down line and someone takes it and in different color ink, in red ink, it makes that one into a four and then it adds, it crosses out the one and writes in four. Well, that's an altered check. Generally, the bank has a duty to inspect and say, hey, there's no problem with this check. We're not going to pay it. That's fine. Again, though, if you give a blank check to someone or if you're grossly negligent and it's drawn, the customer can have some liability. And usually we're looking at the first person that takes the altered check as having the ultimate liability here. All right. Deposits can be a, an issue. Um, and this is something that's really changed, certainly in my lifetime. Um, whereas, you know, before the advent of very rapid presentation of checks, you could write a check and the check would have to be physically moved from, say, California to Wisconsin or from Alaska to Florida in order to be cash. So there might be a, a degree of time going out. But what started to happen is there's more electronic presentation, really starting in the late 80s into the 90s and the 2000s. We basically have said if you've got a local check you've got one business day to make your funds available for your bank and if it's an out of state it's a non-local check you got five business days to give credit now if it's cash you got to give credit certified check credit cashier's check credit internal check written on that bank credit or a government check also there's some issues about withdrawing money after 5 p.m. and you've probably seen those at the ATM and ATMs have some separate reasons. All right, the next thing that we need to look at here is but well, what what happens to the money that's deposited? So in, at its crudest level and banks make money a lot of different ways, but at its crudest level, a bank makes money by you deposit money in the bank, $100. They pay you an interest rate in theory as opposed to the savings account so they pay you two percent interest well what they do is they take that hundred dollars and they invest it maybe they create a mortgage maybe they uh, invest in stocks or bonds and what they're hoping is they can earn a greater rate of interest than the interest they pay and their profit is the difference between these two well Obviously, what a bank would like to do is pay almost no interest on any money deposited. And several banks would had all sorts of things that they did up and through the early 1990s. One of the things that we would do is this. Let's suppose you had a large amount of money that you kept in your checking or savings account every day for a month. So there was at least $10,000. And in one day, uh, you took out almost all the money. Uh, because you were paying off something. So if 28 out of the 
29 days or 30 days in the month, there was $10,000 in the account. And on those other two days, there was just $1,000 in the account. Well, banks used to say, well, we're only going to pay the amount, the minimum amount that was in on any given day in the month. And you can see how that would maximize their profits some. Well, the Truth and Savings Act made them stop that. You have to pay basically on a per day basis. And you get interest calculated as APR. And you, we also have to have explained to us um, the penalties, the fees, the charges as they apply against uh, banks or against depositors. All right, uh, traditional collectors, the players. The depository bank is where you cash the check that you got. The payer bank is the bank against which is drawn. And a collector bank is anybody in between. Sometimes it's also called an intermediary bank. So let me give you an example. Let's suppose, and if you want to, on page 527 of the text, they've got this little circular chart. But I'm going to give you a practical example. You're in San Francisco. You're buying some bread on Fisherman's Wharf, some of that great sourdough bread. You write a check to Acme Bakery of San Francisco. You are the drawer. You hand the check to Acme Bakery. So your name is John Doe. John Doe is writing a check to Acme. Acme is the payee. Okay. Now the payee, Acme, at the end of the day, will take that check and they will deposit it in their local bank. Let's suppose their local bank is the First National Bank of San Francisco. So that is that gets deposited. That's the depository bank here. Now, your bank, you're from North Carolina, is the First National Bank of Fuquay. So in this scenario, depository bank, First National Bank of San Francisco, payer bank, First National Bank of Fuquay. But you notice that those two may not know each other, but hopefully there is a bank in between, an intermediary bank. Maybe it's the Federal Reserve. Maybe it's a specific bank like Wells Fargo that might have branches in both. So that payor bank will turn that check over. It will endorse it over to an intermediary bank. As I said, sometimes the Federal Reserve, sometimes a collecting bank. And that collecting bank will present it to your depository bank. Okay, your excuse me, your 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 payor bank, not depository bank, my mistake. They'll take the money and they'll kick it back down so that Acme Bake Me ultimately will get credit in its account at the First National Bank of San Francisco. And that's how traditional collection works. Now, uh, what about some timing issues here? Okay, so if the depository bank and the payor bank are the same, any check that is not dishonored by the second day is considered paid. And that can be important. If they're different and there's no intermediary bank, if one has got, say, they're doing a teller check, they have an account in another one, then you can't hold the check past midnight that night. You can defer post. You can treat it as deposit and give the next day credit, but you can't hold it. Very often, the Federal Reserve, I mentioned them a little bit, electronically encodes these checks and presents them between banks. It becomes kind of a super intermediary bank. It allows us to have banks thousands of miles apart in the United States deal with each other. And sometimes you've got an agreement to do that. That's a truncation agreement, but you don't need those much anymore. Um, so typically what happens is we encode a check. So the Federal Reserve or somebody, even the depository bank, will decode the reserve, the, the check. So they'll put, OK, this is the routing number. You've seen those at the bottom. We'll stamp it. Uh, with the account, it'll be electronically presented, it'll work its way electronically, and then come back to um, your account, get cashed, and the money will go back. This encoding, when you do it, it creates a warranty that you did the encoding right. In 2004, we wanted to speed up the system. So we did have some truncating agreements where banks had these electronic agreements to treat people the same, but some banks didn't have them. So Congress really wanted to have the business community embrace it. Um, the, and it's, it's kind of an element of capitalism to say that the faster money can move through a system, the less sticky it is, the faster growth. So if 
I can lend you money, you can spend that money, and the, where you spend it, that guy can spend it on something else, and that guy can spend it on something else. And you can do that all very, very rapidly. You don't have to wait, well, I gotta wait five days for the check to clear, and okay, I, he's got the money, he's gotta wait five days. If you can do that really fast, then more money can flow through the system. So the purpose of Check 21 was to speed it up, and it allowed digital imaging of checks. And it would say, okay, this is a legal copy of the check. You can use it the same way as the original check, and you no longer needed these truncation agreements to accept electronic checks. So are we at the end of paper checks? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I don't think we are. We, we still are. Um, they're, they're still being used, particularly by businesses. Um, now, Fed, or Check 21 is federal law. One of the things it has done is, is it reduced its float time, the amount of time you kind of had credit out there pending before a check came through, which was good and bad for consumers and banks. All right, so let's talk about the 900-pound gorilla in the room, electronic funds, because if you're like me, most of my business, uh, most of my checks that I write now are electronic checks, fund transfers. So this is all going to fall under um, a federal system. Now, also Article 4A of the UCC, Electronic Funds Transfer Act. And you can use the EFT either through ATMs, point of sales, which are your debit cards, direct deposit withdrawals, and, and also sometimes your, your, your kind of computer or pay by telephone systems. Regulation E from the Federal Reserve covers most FTEs. And if we're talking about cards, let's just talk about bank cards and using them as electronic. One of the things it did was it set a limit on liability. If you lose a card, your liability is 50 bucks, maxing out at 500. You also have to find errors on statements that have been electronically presented within 60 days. The bank has 10 days to respond or has to refund money. Banks have to give receipt at terminal, uh, terminals. Now, of course, they're allowed to send you the receipt if you like. Uh, banks must also issue monthly statements. Again, this can be done electronically increasingly. And they have to allow you to stop pre-authorized uh, payments for up to three days before they're scheduled. What happens when there's an authorized uh, treatment? Well, if it's done by someone without authority to transfer, or if the customer had gotten no benefit, or if the customer didn't finish a code or card or ID for this transfer, it's a federal crime. And it'll get you 10 years and $10,000. If there's any sort of problem with the bank here, it can actually come back and bite the bank. They can actually wind up paying damages and if, if there's a class action against the bank, we can show that the bank was routinely engaged in this, was either laundering money or was uncareful about it. The, the fines can go up to 1% of the net worth of the bank or $500,000, which can be a tremendous amount of money. All right, uh, e-cards, e-money. Now, obviously, sometimes you hear the term digital cash, which exists only electronically, and there's some obvious problems here. I mean, this could be a way in which money is laundered. Um, one of the places we see this e-money is store cards. And you can't go in a grocery store in the United States of any size without seeing a little wall of cards. Oh, do you want to buy a store card for Chipotle? Or do you want to buy it for Bass Pro Shop or this or that or this? Um, also, increasingly, our credit cards that we use are smart cards. They have chips inside them. Let's talk about that e-money value cards. Why are they so popular? Well, it's not in your text. So the reason they're so popular is they're so profitable because a fair number of people don't use them even after they buy them. They buy one of these e-cards for $100. They give it to someone or they stick it in their wallet and they forget about it. And whoever has got that money in their hot little hands and obviously, if you bought one at Harris Teeter, Harris Teeter is going to remit some of that money after paying a commission being paid to them to, you know, Bass Pro Shop, whatever we're talking about. Bass is going to hold that money. And that's an interest-free loan for them, which is great, particularly if it's never redeemed. And that the amount of unredeemed cards is very high. Um, so e-money is, is interesting. Um, I think we're 
still going to see more and more of this, and I think there's going to be lots of new iterations and probably a requirement for new UCC regulations. We are seeing online banking. As I said, most of my banking is done online. I assume most of your banking is done online. Um, there have been some problems with online deposits. Your book's a little dated there because, of course, we now have photo acceptance. I do deposit checks by taking pictures of them all the time now. Now, getting actual money, uh, it's kind of hard still to get cash if you want to hold cash, but people are using rechargeable cards uh, online, so it's, it's certainly happening. Online banking has come a long way, such that now we have several banks that exist uh, without mortar and brick locations. All right, final thing really to talk about here is some um, regulatory compliance. Most regulations were initially written for physical banks. Now some banks are completely virtual and I think we are running into the issue of which of these laws should apply to these online banking entities and are they the same thing as banks? Are they going to meet some of the same definitions? This can create um, all sorts of problems about privacy and should the Federal Reserve regulate things like those cards? I mean, if the Federal Reserve is in charge of our currency and these cards are taking the change of our currency, shouldn't they be regulated by the governmental agency that regulates our currency, the Federal Reserve? Well, right now, not so much. And some of that is a pushback from different companies that own or do these things, but right now that's where we are. Okay, so we, that was about... Um, uh, 40 minutes, 37, 36, 6 minutes. Um, we've finished out chapters um, 24, 25, 26, excuse me, <laughs> 25, 26, 27, 28, which is all of Unit 5. Um, now, you will have a test coming up on Unit 5, and then uh, after that, we're going to move into chapters 29, 30, and 31 which are really, uh, we began to talk about creditors' rights and bankruptcy. So we're going to leave behind a lot of those negotiable instruments that we talked about, although you're going to hear echoes and references to it um, in regards to some of the secure transactions. Um, so I think it's, you know, I think this was a good foundation for you to look at. I hope you also enjoyed it, and uh, whenever you're ready, I will have uh, your next chapter, chapter 29, up for you.